What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And in this episode, we're continuing our Lenten devotion through the treasury of daily prayer, focusing on God's word and the faith of our fathers and that little bit of catechesis. Stick around. <music> Wednesday in the first week of the season of Lent, the season of repentant joy, we live out that Jesus' words are true, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we meditate on God's word and we reflect on the faith of those faithful cloud of witnesses that has gone before us. And we meditate on the commandments and realize in them our inability to keep them, and the graciousness of God to send forth his Son in time and space to bear our sin and to be our Savior. We begin. We're in the Gospel of Mark, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 1. Again he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. The whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. So the word of God is sown among all types of people. The word of God is for everyone. And Satan will try desperately to take it away from us. And it might be received with joy, but then persecution comes. And if there's no root in it, but we pray to our God that he would make us good soil to receive his word and to grow and to produce fruit and to thank him for that fruit, not to look at ourselves and say, oh, look at all this fruit that I've borne. The word is for everyone, and it should be sown in all places now for our reading from the church fathers, from the solid declaration of the formula of Concord. God's word testifies that the intellect, heart, and will of the natural, unregenerate person in divine things are not only turned entirely away from God, but also are turned and perverted against God to every evil. Also, a person is not only weak, incapable, unfit, and dead to good, but is also sadly perverted, infected, and corrupted by original sin so that he is entirely evil perverse and hostile to God by his disposition and nature. 
he is very strong, alive, and active in everything that is displeasing and contrary to God. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Genesis 8.21 The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17.9 St. Paul explains this passage from Jeremiah writing, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Romans 8.7 for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, Romans 7.18. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, Romans 7.22-23. The natural or fresh... Bleh. The natural or fleshly free will in St. Paul and in other regenerate people strives against God's law even after regeneration. Was it not much more stubborn and hostile to God's law and will before regeneration? Therefore it is clear, as it is further declared in the article about original sin to which we now refer for the sake of brevity, the free will from its own natural powers cannot work or agree to work anything for its own conversion, righteousness, and salvation, nor follow, believe, or agree with the Holy Spirit, who through the gospel offers a person grace and salvation. From its inborn wickedness, rebellious nature, it resists God and his will with hostility unless it is enlightened and controlled by God's Spirit. Certainly a harsh truth about the nature of man, but also in this a great comfort, I think. This is certainly the law, that we are hostile and rebellious towards God, and we pervert the things of God by our very nature, even as St. Paul points out, when we have been regenerated, when we desire to do the will of God. Still, the seed is choked out, and that's our fault, not God's. The seed is good. <laughs> but in this is great hope, in that... We're not dependent upon ourselves or our intellect or our will or our works or our worthiness to merit salvation, but it is given to us as a free gift of God, preached to us by the promise of the gospel that Christ is sufficient, that his suffering, death, and resurrection was for us, and he credits us with his righteousness, and faith clings to the promise. Now, for our continued Lenten devotion, we're on to the fourth commandment, out of the large catechism. <clears throat> Honor your father and your mother. To the position of fatherhood and motherhood, God has given special distinction above all positions that are beneath it. He does not simply command us to love our parents, but to honor them. Honor includes not only love, but also modesty, humility, and submission to a majesty hidden in them. Honor requires not only that parents be addressed kindly and with reverence, but also that both in the heart and with the body, we demonstrate that we value them very highly and that, next to God, we regard them as the very highest. In this commandment belongs a further statement about all kinds of obedience to persons in authority who have to command and to govern, for all authority flows and is born from the authority of parents. Where a father is unable to educate his rebellious and irritable child, he uses a schoolmaster to teach his child. If he is too weak, he gets the help of friends and neighbors. If he departs this life, he delegates and confers his authority and government upon others who are appointed for the purpose. The same should also be said about obedience to civil government. Here, father is not one person from a single family, but it means that many people are father as tenants, citizens, or subjects, though through them, as through our parents, God gives us food, house, and home, protection, and security. They bear such name and title with all honor as their highest dignity that it is our duty to honor them and to value them greatly and the dear, as the dearest treasure and the most precious jewel upon earth. Besides these are still spiritual fathers. The only ones called spiritual fathers are those who govern and guide us by God's word. In this sense, St. Paul boasts of his fatherhood in 1 Corinthians 4.15, where he says, I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, since they are fathers, they are entitled to their honor, even above all others. This is a hard one. This also is the first in the second table 
of the law. Commandments 1 through 3 are the first table about God. So when Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, how is that done? By keeping the first three commandments. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So as the first commandment, it's the hardest for us to obey that we shall have no other gods, that we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. This commandment and the first commandment of the second table, honor your father and mother. This is hard for us to bear. As children, we never do it. We never do it. <laughs> and as adults, we've come sometimes, I suppose, to resent our parents or hate our parents. Maybe they weren't good parents. But we are to honor their position of authority. And we are to honor our employers. And we are to honor our government. And we are to honor our pastors. These are people whom God has put in positions of authority over us so that they may give to us that which is needful and that which is good. And the abuse of that thing, especially in, in American culture with, with political leaders and with, with government, um, it can be abused and often is. It is with parents. Parents abuse their children all the time. But the abuse of a thing does not negate the goodness of in the intent of the thing. Parents and authority are given as good gifts of God for us. And Satan cannot destroy them. He cannot take them away. He can only pervert and corrupt them. But Christ has died and risen again so that even broken parents and broken teachers and broken employers and broken governments and, yes, even broken pastors or priests can be forgiven. And Jesus Christ has suffered and died and risen again so that when we disobey our parents or other authorities, we too can be forgiven. We pray. Almighty and merciful God, of your bountiful goodness, keep us from all things that may hurt us, that we, being ready in both body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish whatever you would have us do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.